Matilda Ferguson and Lola Penny from Youth Climate Strike to address our meeting, please. Imagine a bathtub. Both taps are on and the water is flowing fast. 
It has been scientifically proven that unless you turn off both taps before the water reaches the brim in 11 minutes, your bath will flood. So what do you do? You're not going to wait until the inevitable destruction, destruction of your new bathroom tiles and then figure out a way to mop up the damage. You would do the logical and obvious thing. Do something while you still have time. Turn off the tap before it's too late. Thank you very much. And if we get started on it now, 
we will be driving all sorts of organizations to produce technology which will make it easier, cheaper, and more effective. But the key thing is, which is why I thought it really worthwhile to come to Liverpool, city which I love, city which I know a good deal about, where I work at the moment, uh, if I dare say it, working for Everton Football Club. So those who don't like Everton, let us shut up. Yes, I, but the fact of the matter is, uh, I'm thrilled to be here because what we are doing today is really important. Because however much we advise the government, however much we provide proof that the government isn't doing what it ought to do, however much we may find ourselves taken into court as, uh, uh, not, not against us, but as uh, witnesses for the prosecution of the government doesn't do what it is now statutorily required to do. Because that's what this means. What the government has done is to put its own head into the new so to speak. It has said that this is the statutory requirement to get to net zero by 2050. And of course, once it's passed that, it can't change it. The really remarkable thing about the Climate Change Act, which if you remember was an all-party act, was invented by the Conservatives, joined in by the Liberals and the, and the Nationalists, even the, the the, the, the Protestant Unionist Party for the Northern Ireland, and then the government, the Labour government, took it on so that it was universally supported and there were only eight people voting against it. So it is a really genuinely cross-party act. The beauty of that act is that once Parliament has passed the uh, targets, it can't change them without the permission of the Climate Change Committee. We're eight or nine uh, scientists and um, economists, and I'm the only uh, non-scientist or economist, I'm supposed to keep them together, which they do, more or less, they behave themselves extraordinarily well. But here we are. So we, we've got this very clear aim. So why Liverpool? The truth is, it won't be done centrally. It can only be done if every locality takes its part. These things are done street by street, and house by house. These things are done local organisations, by local companies, by the way that people locally make their decisions. There is no way of doing this centrally. And already cities like uh, Leeds, for example, have set up a climate change commission which advises the Leeds City Council just as we advise the government. Already that's been followed by uh, uh, work in Birmingham and in Belfast, that's not easy. Belfast and in uh, Edinburgh, and we're following on with that, with what's happening in Bristol and Cambridge, and I hope soon to be Reading and Norwich. And Liverpool's uh, independent decision to do this is really important for all of us, because if you don't do it, other people won't do it. And I want really to press that point home. One of the problems when you're debating this in the House of Commons or the House of Lords is that some clever dick always gets up and says, we're only 2% or 1% of the world's emissions. Why on earth shouldn't we let other people start and then we follow on? The reason is that if you don't do it yourself, you can't ask other people to do it. That's the first thing. The second thing is that most of the climate change that is happening today, we caused. Because it was our leadership in the Industrial Revolution that has caused that uh, uh, remarkable effect. We didn't know, so we can't be blamed for it, but now we do know we are responsible for it. And after all, we grew rich because of it. These beautiful buildings in Liverpool are the result of the uh, uh, remarkable prosperity which the Industrial Revolution brought to all of us. So we have to do it, not just to get other people to do it, but because we are genuinely responsible and we dare not therefore step down from that. And so far, so far, Britain has done better than other countries. Now we've got to turn the good words into practice. And I want to leave you, because I know you're going on to discuss each of these sections, I want to leave you with just some very simple things. Why is it? that we're building crack houses. Every single house we build today is not at the level it ought to be in order to combat climate change. We're building houses where we actually make everybody who buys one 
pay a cost every month in the extra uh, bill they get for their heating. We built them properly, they have much smaller bills, we'd be able to reach out to the poorest because they're the ones who are most affected and will be most affected by climate change. Secondly, why on earth don't we have a situation in which Liverpool City Council, Liverpool Council, the whole of uh, uh, government procurement only procures on the basis of working with people who are fighting climate change? Why don't we use the power that we've got to make those choices? Thirdly, why don't we very simply insist in the future that we start to reach the target of uh, all electric vehicles by 2030 or 2035 at the latest? 2040 is far too late and we have to tell Mr. Gray in the back to the back. It has to come back. Fourthly, why don't we actually say to ourselves, everything we do, we ought to have the question, how do we make this better as far as climate change is concerned? How do we constantly ask that question? And then lastly, how do we recognise that climate change, and in this I'm quoting the Pope because it seems to me that his insight in that dark and sea is the most important insight of all. Climate change is the symptom of what we've done to the world. We're not just talking about climate change, we're talking about by the way in which we have destroyed um, uh, the species of this world. So well remarked by the two young people who spoke. It's about poverty in the world. It's about the way we've misused the land. It's by the way we haven't planted the trees. It's the way we have treated other people. All those things are what we've done to the planet, which is our only planet, and upon which we depend for our health. All that is true. And therefore, in fighting climate change, we are actually doing a much wider job than that. And we're beginning to learn again to live as we ought to live, as human beings in harmony with nature, instead of raping and pillaging, which is what we have done for so many generations. And we are all in this together, not only in the solution, but also in the causes. I never want to get one political party crowing over another. I never want uh, businesses to crow over the fact that they've done well and others haven't. I never want trades unions to think that they're doing it better than businesses. We have all got it wrong, and we have all got to put it right. And the fact that I believe that Liverpool is determined to do that makes the possibility of coming here and doing my best to help you do it really exciting and valuable. Thank you for the opportunity and every power to your own.
where we can make a difference not only uh, to uh, our own residents, but to our city, but to also to future generations. And I think, uh, for me, the challenges I'm talking about, and uh, John Bummer talked about, about the climate deniers, those that actually believe that doesn't exist, or it's not caused uh, by climate change or a climate emergency. And it's important that we understand and recognise that. But equally important that we recognise that we have to set uh, an example. Because in December in 2015, there were 197 countries that signed up and reached an agreement to limit global temperatures to an increase below 2 degrees Celsius this century. And yet, there is only seven countries so far that have actually signed up to that. And that includes countries that don't need to do anything because they are climate neutral. And that is a real serious issue for us but also for the government. What I want to say and pay tribute to the leaders of the political groups that joined me in having a discussion and a debate about this uh, motion, because I think, quite frankly, we've laid on this issue our political differences to one side for what I believe is the best interest and the good of our city. And it is set out in that motion and explained in that motion the journey that we all together must make. Because as rightly said by our students, climate change is not something that's a threat to our children or our children's children. It is happening right now. It's here. It's now. It's in front of us. And we must do all we can as a city but also as individuals, as families, as communities, as organisations, as businesses working together to actually do something about it. And of course we don't have to go too far back to look in history how together we can make a difference. And you only have to look at the 60s, the 50s, the 60s and the smog that caused, caused real debilitation in terms of the industrial uh, industries that caused smog and respiratory problems for the poorest, in not just in Liverpool, but in Manchester, in Leeds, and in the big cities uh, across the country. And we introduced in the 60s the Clean Air Act. So it shows that with real joined up thinking and a commitment that you can start to do something about it. And of course, we only have to look at the river, the River Mersey, and the pollution of the River Mersey. And isn't it ironic, of course, that as we have cleaned up the Mersey, over the last 20 years with a clean up pr programme we're seeing uh, fish return to the river, salmon, um, you know, we also see um, other wildlife here within the River Mersey. And yet, just recently it's been exposed by Greenpeace that the challenges that we face are microplastics being dumped into the River Mersey, making us one of the most polluted again, after all the work that we've done over the last 20 years. And that's a disgrace that businesses in the city, in the city region, are jumping that into our rivers and we've got to make sure that not only do we identify them but we use the full powers to actually punish them and find them and find them out of existence if that is the case that they've been doing that. But we also need to look at action on energy, on transport, on housing, on biodiversity and tonight, you know, um, you've heard already it's been announced that we're having a dedicated cabinet member for climate change. Councillor Laura Robinson Collins will be responsible for coordinating our response to this massive and important issue for us. But I just also think it's important that we recognise uh, that we're not starting from zero as a city on this. Two years ago, I laid out a vision to prioritise walking, cycling and electric vehicles and clean fuels in the city. And we've cut 840,000 tonnes of CO2 from the atmosphere since 2005. 
That's the equivalent of 2.4 million tonnes of coal being burned. And by next year, we'll have reduced carbon emissions by 42% since 2005. We will be buying green energy. We've converted our street cleansing vehicles to electricity. We've installed 27,000 LED lights, street lights, with a programme only halfway through. We've invested in solar panels and major venues such as the Arena and Convention Centre in Liverpool, banned taxis from retrofitting fitting higher pollutant engines. Our new bus hub in the city centre will be moved 900,000 dead kilometres and 2,000 tonnes of carbon dioxide every single year by providing a layover facility. Last week I announced in total £4 million for new cycle lanes so that we can get our grandchildren, our children and our adults to cycle safely around the city. Our connectivity scheme will reduce traffic congestion in the most polluted areas like the Strand, the East Islington, Bowery Park Road by the Robbers. And through our One Tree Per Child scheme, our children have planted 12,000 trees in the past two years and are on course to plant 4,000 trees more next year. And I can also announce tonight that the city is starting detailed work on how we can take heat from the River Mersey and our dock system in our waters to directly heat buildings on the waterfront, including our own Cunard building, saving up to 10,000 tonnes of CO2 a year and also saving us massive amounts of money. That's innovation, that's thinking differently, but I know that we haven't always got it right and we need to do so much more. But let's be clear again, and it's important that we recognise this as we move forward, that we can't do it alone. We do need central government. We do need the combined authority and the other authorities working together because air quality and air pollution don't know borders. They don't stop at one particular border. They pollute us all. So it's important Mersey travel to uh, put electric and hybrid buses on the most just congested routes. And in fact, Liam, for pushing on that, it is absolutely essential. But also, what we do with the, the Mersey itself, and whether it's a barrage or whether it's tidal energy systems, we need to really push and drive on that to make sure it happens. We're probably one of the many, well, probably one of the few cities that has the opportunity to really make use of a tidal system that in spring tides has an 11 metre drop. So working with our partners also to reduce waste, we spend 25 million a year just treating waste, just treating it so that we can then uh, get rid of it. 25 million, just think of what we could do if we save 50% of the waste that we actually have to treat. And just think what we could do with that money. And then, of course, critically, we need to make sure that the industries of the future, for example, in the science sector, are sustainable, cleaner and greener, and work alongside us to make sure that they deliver on those targets that we set them and which we will set them. So we're also setting up the Select Committee to scrutinise and help drive that way. So we're in it's important for us to actually um, set ambitious targets for the city. It's important that we do, and we won't shake away from setting targets, ambitious targets. And we can look at what others have done, and we can compare ourselves to what others have done in terms of their targets. I'm happy that we've gone for 2030 because we should have ambition to achieve that. We should set a target that is demanded, but I believe if we all work together, we can achieve that. But if we are really to make a difference, then we also do need government to step up and give us the devolution and powers and resources from Whitehall to local leaders. We have got to be able to uh, use building control to make sure that we are building those houses. We are determined to push government to give us the powers to make sure that builders do build sustainable houses for the future. So after 10 years, we're not going in and retrofitting them. They're built sustainably.
sustainable for the future with triple glazing, with photovoltaic roofs or whatever else we need to do in terms of insulation to save on energy. And it's obscene and you've heard me mention it on many, many occasions that when we retrofit properties or when we modernise properties with triple glazing or photovoltaic roofs, government slap on a 70% VAT. What type of system is that that you punish people for wanting to actually reduce emissions? So we've got to force government, we've got to push and demand that government, now that they've adopted the climate change of agency, help us to achieve the goals and the targets that we set. We also need a Clean Air Act, a scrapping scheme for the most political vehicles and appropriate funding to actually help us tackle the air quality problems that we have. So we're looking at supporting our taxi fleet to move from diesels to electric. We're looking at instead of them going to pay APR on a loan that they get to pay £65,000 for a vehicle of 8, 9, 10%, we look at supporting them at a reduced rate at an NPR through the Public Sector Works Loan Board of between 2 and 1.5%. And so it saves their money and incentivises them to actually make that change. And we'll be lobbying hard through the UK 100 initiative to demand that Whitehall implements the changes that and provides the money that we desperately need if we are to do the things that we need to do and we need to act now. So as hard as it is in politics, we've set aside, I believe, our differences to work together on this particular issue. It is not one party's area, it is all of every single party, every single councillor, every single person in our city to make that change. Because everyone here in the chamber, whatever political party you belong to, can and should commit to making a real difference. And so my message is clear tonight and it's to those across the city and it's to every single person who's listening to the debate or who will read about it tomorrow. If our city comes together, stands together on this particular issue, we can not only build a sustainable future for our children, but we can start doing it now if we work together. Let's crack on with it and let's make that difference. Thank you, Mayor Anderson. Can I now invite, invite Councillor Richard Kemp, CBE, to speak, please? Well, uh, as has often happened, although we perhaps don't admit it too much, it's a pleasure to follow and support the elected mayor in what he said today. I particularly would like to start by saying how much I welcome this style of council meeting. Too often we've met here as a council argued furiously about 5% of the motions and then you never to support them all at the end of the day. This seems to me to be much more about adult politics, which enables us perhaps to share some differences, but largely to have meaningful and constructive debates about, in this case, one of the most important issues which faces today. Uh, like uh, the uh, noble lord who spoke before, I'm not doing this for me. I will be well up the chimney before the full effects of climate change start. It's quite possible that my children will also survive the big changes. But today I have three of my grandchildren in my house. They're nine, five and three. And it's for them that I want to take action now. And perhaps for their children as well. The other thing I want to say before we get into the meat of the argument is that I'm very pleased that we resisted the calls to declare a climate change emergency earlier than we have done today. I was at the local government association a week before last and I asked the lot of the council, I went to a session about it, what have you done since you declared the climate change emergency? And um, the answer in those cases, well, what were we supposed to do? I don't think it would have been right for us simply to 
pass a motion and run a flag, uh, a flag up the town hall flagpole, I think it was right to wait until we could have the considered debate with some of the statistics sorted out and some of the ways forward sorted out. And I particularly welcome the fact that today the Mayor has appointed a Cabinet Member for Climate Change solely to do with this issue. I actually welcome the fact it's the person that it is. And that there will be a select committee in which all parties will share that will take this idea forward. But I don't want this Council to adopt any environmental policies today, or for that matter, any other day. I want this council to consider the environment and climate change effects in every single thing that it does. As I have challenged my colleagues who speak for us on the various committees, all of them have been able to say how they think their select committee, the area which they're looking at, could be doing things. Some of those will be brought forward to the select, the, the new select committee, but some of those should be part of the work programmes of every select committee. As we go forward, we will not agree on everything, and that's fine. Today, we're agreeing the big proposition, the major direction, and the principles. We will have some disagreements on the way, but those shouldn't be about the why. They shouldn't be about the need. But they may be, because at some stages we have a genuine difference of opinion about how to deliver some of the things. And providing we conduct the debates on those differences in the right way, then perhaps those differences will only at that stage, in a positive way, contribute to the uh, big picture that we so desperately need. So clearly, this council needs to do some big things. The Mayor has already mentioned housing, and we will be having our next extraordinary our council meeting on that subject in September. Transport is a key item, and employment is a key item as well, because there are those who say, doing these things will put people out of jobs. I don't actually believe that climate change is a job loser. I believe that climate change is a job creator a creator of jobs in the sort of industries, manufacturing and otherwise, which will actually produce some of the innovations. And we're better than Liverpool to start on that by harnessing the power, the knowledge and the intellect of our three universities. So Liverpool needs some big strategies, but those strategies will be composed of lots of small things. Interesting report that some of you will have seen in the uh, Guardian about how in another country all of our shelters have things growing on them. We've got something like 700 bus shelters in Liverpool. Just imagine if we were doing that, the change that that would make to the environment. We need to plant more trees on top of the half million we've uh, already planted. We need to put solar panels on every building. And I think that's going to be difficult, but again we can show the example. Outside the, uh, uh, the parapet, outside the office uh, of the opposition councillors, there's uh, an enclosed area with a parapet behind it, which traps the sun, which should have solar panels on them. Wouldn't affect the listed building. But we actually now own a very small number of buildings. We should be challenging every public sector building owner in this city to also put solar panels and other uh, either energy saving or energy producing uh, products on their buildings. And we should be saying exactly the same to the private sector as well. But whether it's big issues or small ones, this cannot be our fight alone. Lord Devon has made it quite clear that also the government must do things but I would say that there's something even more important than that. Every single one of us in this council chamber must work with our 480,000 fellow residents to think through what we do in a substantially different way. Every resident, every school, every college, every business, every organisation needs to think of the effect of what they do on our environment and also on our health, because the two things are inextricably linked. Just imagine what would happen if everyone who owned a
Chelsea tractor decided to buy a small car. Just think of the effect of every car owner if they reduced the number of journeys they did by 10% by walking to some places or catching the bus. Just think of the effect of that alone. Just think of what would happen if we bought things differently. Alarming reports now of shops where you buy stuff that you're only going to use three or four times, you buy them for a fiver, and you know they're going to disintegrate. And that's clogging up our bins, and we're taking it to, to, to tips, because we can't recycle it. Just imagine if we thought, uh, got people to think about how they buy things, products like that, and products, uh, for example, like food, challenging the air miles, uh, the food miles that brings food to us from all over the world, which could be grown locally or could be brought to us in a different form. <coughs> and how we recycle. Too many people just don't recycle at all. For others, it is quite complicated. I sometimes sit there and think, which bin should this go in? So sometimes we need to help fools like me who'd like to do their bit, but actually are a bit unsure about it. So that's a job for the council. But I don't see any of this as a threat. I see it all as an opportunity. <coughs> Don't we all want to live in a healthier city? Don't we all want a city to live in that's more attractive, that's green and pleasant and safe? Don't we all want to create new jobs in the right industries? Don't we all want more visitors who come here using ecologically sound routes, who come here because we have become a beacon of hope as a green city not only in this country, not only in Europe, but perhaps in the world. All these are prizes within our grasp, providing we work together to do it. So we must now start a conversation with our residents, our businesses, our organisations, to change our culture. We as a council must take the lead in that and show that we walk the walk as well as talking at all. And if we do that, Liverpool will not be an all so round. We will not become a Johnny come lately. But together, everyone in this council chamber can make sure that Liverpool is top of the list for councils taking this climate change problem seriously and doing something about it. My Lord Mayor, it's a pleasure to second that. Councillor Crowe to speak, please. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, firstly, can I thank the speakers, uh, all the speakers from the floor, but particularly the speakers from the Youth Strike for Climate, because it's thanks to groups like yourselves and Extinction Rebellion, as well as all the reports coming from the UN that, in the last few months that have really pushed the issue of the climate emergency up the political agenda. So thank you for that. And a climate emergency is exactly what we're facing. We now know that failing to keep 